And the people of God said amen. amen. Are we blessed by this worship arts ministry this morning? We are grateful for your ministry. And you can't see where you're sitting, but it's a joy to watch Sister Garrett. She's talking with her hands and with her face and with her eyes. And we're grateful for the ministry that lifts us on this day. We are grateful to Pastor Wesley for this opportunity to um, share the good news of Jesus Christ today. I join my colleague, Reverend Sam Peel, in expressing our deep gratitude to the Alpha Street Church family for your long and liberal investment in Christian missions around the world. We're grateful uh, to be with people uh, who know that being a part of what God is doing is more than an event every now and then. But you have to plant and water and plant and water and give God something to work with so that God can give an increase. And we are grateful. For example, uh, Reverend Sam Peel talked about the contemporary and ongoing uh, work and investment in the lives of people. That's what missions is, investing in the lives of people. Not doing projects, but it's about people. And so he's talked about that and expressed gratitude. And so I was reminded that probably a dozen years ago, uh, I remember uh, uh, Deacons June and Charles Monterio and Trustees Juliet and James McNeil uh, going to Liberia and helping us to imagine new ways of investing and organizing. Uh, then a few years ago, uh, Sister Rosette Graham and Reverend Marcia Norfleet and others from the church also had an opportunity to do a short-term missions experience. And so it's a blessing to be able to do something over time so that you can meet people, build relationships, and let God sustain what's going on because it's not about us. It's about being faithful to what God is doing in this world. And so we've come to say both thank you and help us. <laughs> and to God be the glory for the things that God keeps on doing in our lives. Won't you turn your attention with me to the gospel according to Matthew, chapter 6. The gospel according to Matthew, chapter 6. Would you stand as you may be able? I'm going to begin reading the verse 5 and through verse 8. And then after verse 8, I'm going to ask you to either read or pray with me the model prayer. Won't you hear the word of the Lord? And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by people. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward, but you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, Pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. And now join me after this manner, therefore pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. For these few preaching moments today, I want to ask you to gather with me around this preaching subject, praying a grown-up prayer 
look the other way. Look the other way. My earliest memory of learning to pray was kneeling at my bedside at night next to my mother. She taught me that old school prayer that a lot of mothers and grandmothers and occasionally a daddy or two <laughs> taught their children how to pray. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And if I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul. You, you, I, you just had a flashback, didn't you? <laughs> you, just, you? You just went down memory lane <laughs> thinking about that childhood prayer. And that's a good start, but you should never stay where you start. We should move from where we start to a more seasoned prayer. And in this model prayer, it's a prayer of maturity. Not of children praying, but a grown-up prayer. Sometimes you ought to put on your grown-up pants and stop being like a child. And this model prayer, it's a way of helping us to shape our prayer lives so that our prayers will help shape our practice. And I want to talk with you a little bit about learning how to pray looking the other way. I've had a few close calls traveling around the world when I've been in former British colonies who drive on the left side of the road. Most of Europe, most of Africa, most of Asia, most of North and South America, we drive on the right. And so the way that we cross the street is you look left first and then right. As long as you are in Europe, North and South America, most of Africa, and most of Asia. But if you go to a former British colony, like in the Caribbean. If you look left first, <laughs> you may be in a world of trouble. You've got to look the other way. In chapter one of Acts, the disciples of Jesus have gathered. Jesus has told them that when the Spirit comes, that there'll be, dis there'll be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And then he's taken up from them physically, and they're standing there looking in the sky, apparently for too long. Because the question is asked, why are you standing here gazing in the sky? The implication is, look the other way. And there are many people who are in church communities who need to learn to look the other way because too many of us are preoccupied with trying to get to heaven when we die. And there's something going on before you die. Too many of us are just wrapped up about what happens when you die. Part of that is because of an overemphasis on a privatized religion. As though your relationship with Jesus is isolated and restricted and privileged. So it's you and Jesus and those in your little circle. So I'm going to behave myself and I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do with my family, and I'm supposed to take care of my little people, and then when I die, I'll get to go to heaven. While in between now and then, people's lives are falling apart, and you talking about going to heaven when you die. And as a little parenthesis, 
not many of y'all in a hurry to get there. I want to go to heaven when I die, but I'm not homesick. That's, that's the way you do it. But what I want to say to you is that when you're praying a grown-up prayer, you learn that your relationship with Jesus is not private. It's personal, but not private. To say that it's personal means that it is intimate, but your personal relationship with Jesus has public implications. So you cannot be a private Christian. You got to be a personal Christian and live a public testimony. So that people look at you and say, oh, they've been with Jesus. Because when you got a private faith, nobody knows. Nobody knows what your unmentionables look like this morning. That's old school. Because that's private. But when, you, when you're with Jesus, it's personal. It's intimate. And you're close enough for Jesus to make a difference in your life. So that others can see you and tell you have not been conformed to this world. But you've been transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can do what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Your religion is not private. I had an interesting debate with a man. He said, my faith is between me and Jesus. I said, you wrong. It's between you and Jesus and all the rest of us. Because you're supposed to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. You got to grow up so that our religion becomes personal and public. You got to look the other way. You, we got to grow out of that if I die before I wake. I pray the Lord my soul to take and learn how to pray like Jesus says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. See, that's more than that little private prayer. That has public implications and public testimony that I want my life to demonstrate that Jesus has entered history and orders my steps. If we pray that God's will be done, then it means that we are surrendering our will. My soul says yes. It's not what I want. Not praying, Lord, this is my will that I want you to provide for me. God is not your wait staff in your restaurant where you order your meal your way and you send it back if it's not to your order. God is not your wait staff. And we've got to grow beyond the prayer of asking God, do what I want, when I want, the way I want, and say, not my will, but your will be done. What would God's will look like if God was on Capitol Hill? What would the budget look like? That, that's, what this, that's what this prayer is talking about. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth like it is in heaven. So imagine what your federal budget would look like, all y'all federal employees. Imagine what the federal budget would look like if God was on the hill. No more poverty, no more hunger, no more discrimination, no more injustice. But our lives and our world would be organized so that God's house will run right. Now somebody is feeling a little distressed right now. And I'm all right, but that's because you've been conformed to the world. 
And what God is calling us and driving us to do is grow up so that you can pray not for your will, not for your private benefit, but that God's will will be done. A grown-up prayer will lead us to long for and work for justice for all. And justice is not punitive. Justice is distributive. Justice means nobody has too little and nobody has too much, but everybody has enough so that all can be well. God's will on earth is not done by divine intervention. I'm trying to get you to pray a grown-up prayer. Some of us want God to do everything. God, fix this. God, fix that. God, do this. God, do that. You waiting on God, and God's waiting on you. We want things to be done by divine intervention, but I want to tell you, and I better say it slow so you get it. God's will will not be done by divine intervention, but it will happen when you are divinely inspired to participate. It's your participation is what God is waiting on. God is already here. God is already moving. God is already working. God is waiting on us to participate in making God's will real. It's a child who asks God to do everything. God doesn't have to do what you can do. God is trying to inspire us to participate. So that God's will will be done. God wants, uh, I want to suggest we need to quit looking about getting to heaven when we die. Turn and look the other way. Because when you stop looking at heaven, then you can look into the eyes of people who are hurting. When we look the other way, we can look into the eyes of starving children. When you look the other way, you can look into the eyes of abused women. When you look the other way, you can look into the eyes of exploited men. When we stop looking into heaven, we can look into the eyes of people because when you look into the eyes of people, you're looking into the eyes of Jesus. I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and in prison, and you went, came to see about me. Lord, when did we see you hungry, thirsty, naked, in prison, sick, inasmuch as you did it to the least of these? You've done it unto me. When you start praying grown-up prayers, you, get, you stop being preoccupied with getting to heaven and you get preoccupied with making God's will done on earth. When you stop looking to heaven and you look around you, you'll see Jesus in the eyes of people who are in need. Won't you pray with me? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. When you pray a grown-up prayer, you'll look into the eyes of Jesus.